Thanks for the download. Before we start this episode, it would be great if you could rate the podcast on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from, as this helps me know how we're doing and if the content is hitting the mark. If you do like the pod and would like to support it, then you can check out the Buy Me A Coffee link in the show notes, which helps with ongoing costs such as website hosting. My guest today is Patrick Crowley, author of Rose, Castle and Crown, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight Citizen Soldiers, and on this episode we'll cover the history of the Army Reserves, going back to the raising of militias in the 16th century, up to the Army Reserves of the present day. Patrick is currently the Chief Executive of the South East Reserve Forces and Cadets Association, which involves promoting reserves and cadets, tri-service in the nine counties of the South East of England, as well as helping to connect defence with society. He has been in this appointment since retiring from the British Army in 2014, and prior to that, he was commissioned to 1st Battalion of the Queen's Regiment in 1980. He was a major when the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment, the PWRR, was formed in 1992. He serves as a Rifle Platoon Commander, Morthor Officer, Adjutant, Company Commander, 2nd in Command, and commanded the Regiment's 3rd Volunteer Battalion. In addition, he has run many battlefield tours and is a committee member of the Military Historical Society and a trustee in a number of military-related charities and is also Deputy Colonel of the PWRR since 2008. Profits from the sale of Patrick's books will go to the Connaught Trust, which has commissioned the book. It is a charity that aims to promote the military efficiency of all ranks in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, serving in the reserve units of the Royal Navy, the Royal Marines, the Royal Air Force, and other reserve units established by the Ministry of Defence. It also supports the charitable activities of units of the Army Cadet Force, the Sea Cadet Corps, Royal Air Force Air Cadets and the Royal Marines Royal Navy Volunteer Cadet Corps and the Combined Cadet Force. Let's crack on. Thanks for coming to the podcast, Patrick. Can you start by telling us when you joined the Army and what made you enlist in the Queen's Regiment? Uh, Well, thanks, Colin. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I joined the Army in 1979. When I went to Sandhurst, that was after two years at the Army Sixth Form College, World Pet College. Um, I was commissioned into the 1st Battalion of the Queen's Regiment because it was my local regiment and I wanted to join my, my local regiment. So commissioned in 1980. And then, of course, eventually the regiment is amalgamated with the Royal Hampshire Regiment and becomes a Princess of Wales's Royal Regiment in, in 1992. Um, and I'm still a Deputy Colonel of the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment, or PWRR, the Tigers. Good regiment, saw a lot of action in Iraq, and uh, I don't know, yeah. did they go to Afghanistan as well? Uh, yes, they went to Afghanistan as well. Um, um, unfortunately, I wasn't with them, as in serving with them either in Iraq or Afghanistan, although I did a tour in, in Baghdad as a staff officer and ended up there at about the same time as one of their tours, uh, which was nice because I actually saw a little bit of them in the, in the distance. And you retired from the Army in 2014 as a colonel, so can you just give us a brief overview of your time in uniform? Yeah, sure, Colin. Um, so I just did normal infantry type things. Uh, I first tour as a platoon commander in Belize in Central America. Good place to start. Uh, and then regimental duty as a platoon commander, mortar officer, adjutant, company commander, battalion 2IC and commanding officer. Um, so I did more regimental duty than a lot of people. You know, I was commissioned when I was only uh, 19. I was commanding officer of the battalion, the Princess of Wales's Royal Regiment, which still exists and is now an Army Reserve Battalion, but then was a Territorial Army Battalion. Um, I also had postings to Gibraltar and Zimbabwe. Um, I did six years on and off in Northern Ireland, and as I said earlier, I did an operational tour at Baghdad. Um, I also did quite a lot of training jobs. Um, I taught platoon commanders, platoon commanders division. I taught captains of the Army Junior Division, and I taught uh, tri-service officers at the Defence Academy. Looking back to the 80s, you said there you joined when you were 19, which, if I remember correctly, that wasn't unusual back then. You had a lot of young officers coming at the age of 19, which I don't think is the case anymore. And, and do you think that's something that's been lost through time and, and something that 
you always yeah i think it's a bit of a bit of a mix i think the average age of an officer coming through sandhurst now is probably about 25 and that person has probably done three years at university uh, and possibly a year out so it's very different to my generation where the odd person went had gone to university um and those odd people who beat university actually moved through the system quicker so in some ways you you've got more mature between commanders i think but on the other hand, because they're a little bit older, they don't always spend as much time with soldiers at regimental duty, where you learn so much. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a little bit of swings and roundabouts. Yeah. So I'm moving on to the main meat of the matter of tonight then. And it's a subject close to my heart, because regular listeners know I did two years of permanent staff instructor with the TA. I was uh, down in London with the Honourable Artillery Company, and I have great memories of it. And... What made you write your book, Rose, Castle and Crown, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight's Citizen Soldiers? Uh, Well, basically the Connaught Trust, which is a charity that supports reserves and cadets in Hampshire, the Isle of Wight and the adjacent counties, asked me to to write it. I have written some other uh, military books. Um, And because of the job I do now, which is um, running the South East Reserve Forces and Cadets Association in nine counties in the South East, they thought, I was a suitable person to write a book about the part-time soldier, if you like. And whilst if you go if you go to a bookshop in the military section, you will find loads of military books, uh, possibly a load about the British Army, you don't actually come across many about the reservist or the part-time soldier. Um, so actually what they were trying to do was um, fill a gap. And the book gives a, a broad story of that part-time soldier from the beginning till now, the Army Reserve, which hasn't really been done in that way before, and uses Hampshire and the Isle of Wight as examples of where things have changed over the centuries. You mentioned earlier on, Patrick, that there's not a lot of reference material for you, and reading your book, it amazed me at how complicated the subject was, and it had been very easy to go down a rabbit hole. So how did you start writing it? Yeah, it was, a, it was a real challenge because there's not a lot of, not many books written about a part-time soldier in proportion to, to the regular soldier. There's some heavy academic books uh, in specific sort of small areas. Um, but when it comes to the full story from the beginning to the modern soldier, there's nothing actually that exists quite like that, I, I, I would say. Um, and putting it into context of what was going on in the world and putting it into context of the regular army as, as you go through. But all the modern stuff, I had to dig around in sort of magazines, personal accounts from people are in there as, as well. People haven't written much about part-time soldier. And um, with some of the history books, you know, they're, they're covering a, a war, uh, and, and it's a factor that they just don't build in. So, you know, you, you really, I really had to fight hard to find the information, apart from, as I said, some key academic in-depth things that have been done um, but it was rewarding as a result but challenging now the bibliography is is, is quite long um, from all sorts of sources it was fun well it is now now it's finished oh get together <laughs> and are you eyeing up another one not at the moment not at the moment my my previous book was about the regiment which you, know, you might be interested in another occasion which is called infantry diehards um, and that gives the story of uh, the princess wells regiment through through the years, but not from beginning to end, more taking themes. Right. So um, it takes Iraq, it takes Afghanistan, the four wars in Afghanistan, including the, the most recent, and then other topics which blend together the different regiments that make up the modern Princess of Wales' Royal Regiment. So that's another topic. If I recall rightly, and you'll probably shoot me down here because I'll be wrong, but was it, was it the Middlesex Regiment that were called the Die Hearts? Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, after the Battle of Albuera uh, in the peninsula where the uh, commander of the uh, the middle sector, the 57th of foot, as it was there, uh, basically said, or allegedly said to his troops, uh, die 57th, die hard, you know, sort of, at that's least that he's on this hall. So, uh, yeah, that's where the phrase die hard comes from. Yeah, hence the name of the book, Infantry Die Hard. Obviously, you're a keen historian. Are we losing these sort of, this corporate memory in battalions now? There have been so many murders, do you think? Or are, 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 are battalions still keeping that? history alive people try to keep the the traditions going so if you take my own regiment which won't be dissimilar to others but uh we have for example each year a kahima corporal in each of the battalions 
So that's an up and coming call crawl. It's linked to Kahima and the, the, the chap who won a VC there. We then have a sergeant's day, if you like, which is um, Sabran day, which is a battle of the first Sikh war in, in 1846, um, where all the officers carrying the colours were either killed or wounded. So Sergeant Bernard Bacay picks up the regimental colour and the battle is won. Mm. So we have a sergeant, and, and each year, each of the battalions carries a regimental colour. Up and coming Syrian CO carries a regimental colour which is a sort of different thing to do. And then for the officers, you could argue um, you've got um, Lieutenant Latham at the Battle of al who was struck down by lancers and hussars and managed to save the colour under his jacket, um, which is a, you know, a, a famous officer, if you like. That's back in 1811. And then for soldiers, the most important, you've got Johnson Bahari, Victoria, of course, yes. from the recent Iraq conflict in 2004. So... What we've tried to do is is pick out specific things that cover different ranks, if you like. So it's not an officer sport or just a senior NCO sport. We cover all it covers all ranks, but it's challenging because there's been so many amalgamations and people forget things, and so you know you can lose certain things. So actually, my my role in, in the regiment as a deputy colonel, I've got the type I've got heritage under my remit, mm-hmm. so uh, I just try and keep these things ticking over. I mean, the Royal Artillery does it slightly different in that we have uh, our heritage encapsulated in a what's called a battery honour title. So, for example, I was yeah. in K. Hondigan Battery, and Hondigan was a battle that was fought in the retreat from Dunkirk. And the good thing about having a World War Two battery honour title is you can still it's still within memory, just and yeah, we go across to Hondigan every year. I can't let it go, not me, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> the current That's lads, great. glasses. <laughs> And they go across every year, they're hosted by the village. So it really leads me on to my next question then. You and I just discussed it, how important we consider this corporate memory and all the rest of it, and the regimental traditions within the British Army. Do you ever foresee where the, the army gets so small that they do what they've done to the Royal Regiment of Scotland? You know, you've had... All right, I know they've they kept somewhere in the title, Black Watch, etc., but I feel that those battalions have lost quite a bit by just being one Scots, two Scots, three Scots. Do you ever see that happen in the, uh, the English regiments? Yeah, it's not easy uh, because there were some people who might say, why don't you have a corps of infantry uh, and you don't even bother with names? So one, two, three, four, et cetera. What different regiments have different things binding them together, I think. you know. So if if you are in the Barashi regiment, you've got the Maroon Berry or, or, or whatever, and the extra fitness and, and, and so on. What binds my regiment together, one of the things that binds it together is, is generally we're from the southeast of England, of a certain type of person in the southeast of England, which does create a bond because we're generally from the same same region, and that's the case with a lot, a lot of regiments. So even if we were amalgamated again and again, you know, I was brought up just outside Guildford. I joined my local regiment. At that stage, it was the Queen's Regiment. If I joined now, it'd be PWRR. If I joined in the future, perhaps it's something else, but Having those regional connections does create one bond. Um, obviously, the ultimate bond is just going on operations where everyone works together anyway because they're a common, a common threat. But on my own regiment, it has had a lot of amalgamations. It's had 12 regiments of foot coming together and um, over the years. And that means that you know there's been a lot of change. And when we became the Queen's Regiment, we started off with, with names after each battalion from previous regiments. And that proved a little bit divisive, actually. Mm. Um, so we actually mixed it all up when we became PWRR. It's, it's difficult. I think I would um, lean against going to a core infantry, for example, because I think the traditions can still be kept. But just you keep them in a slightly different way. Yeah. You know, you have to you have to amalgamate, you have to adjust to the to the situation. And I think all the corps, armed services, will do their best to pick and choose the best from the past, and, and inevitably some of the things. Won't, won't be mentioned so much, but at least they can make use of some of those examples of uh, tremendous behaviour, bravery, or, or whatever it happens to be. So I, I think that no matter how you organise yourself, you, it's worth having the, that, that little bit of tradition because it really helps create that sort of team spirit or esprit de corps. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And you do get... It sometimes can work. We see the rifles did with the green jackets yeah. and the light infantry. Yeah. They, yeah, took, well. they took a gamble, didn't they? Went for a big yeah. rifles regiment and they managed to forge their identity. But I think that comes all down to what was the golden thread there was that late, late infantry heritage, I think. And I think that was a, mate, 
enabled them to do that. No, you're, you're right. Although there were some of their full bear regiments that were not light infantry. Oh, right. Okay. So, so, oh, it was RGBW and, and the Gloucesters and yeah, they taken them. Yeah, them and the Yeah, there there were there, there there were people there who hadn't had that before. But that has been a, a, a successful move. It we worked. Yeah, absolutely. The one thing the British Army is always, regardless of your infantry, you're a gunner, you're a sapper, we're always flexible, and we've had to Very do it over the centuries. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. It's a book I'll recommend at the end of the podcast because I always do that in the podcast, as regulars will know. And I initially Thank thought you. it was going to be quite stovepipe, but as you say, it is not the case. You're using uh, the Isle of Wight soldiers, sitting tree soldiers, as a vehicle for getting the message across. And I was quite taken aback by what a complicated backstory it is. Yeah. And. One thing that came out of it was the British have always been suspicious of large standing armies and we tended to rely on reserves in times of conflict. Yes. And you quote this story in Ian Beckett who summarised five common threads for use of reserve forces throughout the ages, including up to the present day, and these are defence against invasion, use for internal disorder, social control through habits of duty and discipline, to supplement and provide an alternative to regular full-time forces, and interestingly, Bear in mind what's been in the papers re- lately. Avoid the use of a conscription to enlarge the army. Yeah. And the numbers you quote in your book took me by surprise when compared to the current strength of around 73,000 soldiers and 30,000 reserves. And as an example, in 1897, uh, and this is a few years after the UK population census, when the population of the UK was 33 million, there was 216,688 regular army soldiers an army reserve of ex-regulars of 80,000, a militia reserve of 30,000, a militia of 75,000, volunteers of 255,000, and yeomanry of 9,500. I mean, that's absolutely astonishing <laughs> figures, isn't it? It is. It's it, it's amazing. And um, it's all about, really, about the balance of your defence insurance policy. Um, because over the centuries, as a part-time soldier developed, and the part-time soldier was older than the regular soldier, um, any government, and this would apply anywhere around the world, has to decide what's the what's the balance of spending money. So, as we're in Ireland, um, actually a very good way of spending money at, at that stage was spending on the Royal Navy, because if you've got the Royal Navy protecting the island, uh, actually you don't have to rely too much on a huge home defence, um, and then. How do you balance your home defence with overseas? So at the time uh, you mentioned in the late 19th century, we've got an empire, you've got to police the empire. uh, And effectively, most of the regular army was overseas doing various tasks. So you had to have someone back here to do the home defence. And generally, as a home defence policy, uh, well, let's use the militia, the yeomanry and the volunteers, which are pretty cost effective because you only spend the money when you have to mobilize them um, and they'll only be mobilized if the Royal Navy lets us down if you like and, and the enemy get through um, so you have that sort of particular picture and then you've also got the balance of what you spend the money on so do you spend money on um, regulars how many regulars do you spend money on the part-time element which I've just described do you spend money on mercenaries just like the Russians have more recently, um, or private companies. So what's the balance of, of all that? And if you've got, you know, ten pounds spent on defence, which bit of it's regular, which is this, which is that, and, and so on. And that um discussion's been going on for centuries. But of course when the part time soldier started off, it was all about what the landowner owned, how wealthy he was, and he provided the home defence. He was bl- obliged by law to turn out a certain amount of people, if you like, on parade. Um, And then other laws came in, which said, well, of those people you turn out, they have to be equipped with the following types of pikes and weapons and so on. So that's the sort of the the real basis um, of of the army. People forget that the modern British army didn't really start off until the 1660s, after Charles II came onto the throne. Before that, uh, the majority of defending of the country was done by the part-time soldier and that goes all the way back to the saxon feared um and then we're talking about the militia so the militia is the oldest element 
you, you've just touched on the militia there, and I missed earlier on volunteers, yeomanry, territorial force, army reserves. These are all names under which citizen soldiers have served the nation on a part-time basis. So can you talk us through how the force came about and the differences between the roles? Yeah, it's, it, it seems quite complicated now when we, in, in a sense now, we have the volunteer part-time soldier who's in the army reserve, or you might have uh, a member of the strategic reserve who's a, an ex-regular who has a commitment for a few years to be called up, potentially. But back then, uh, if, you, if you go way back, we, you go, go back to the militia, which is the oldest bit, as, as I said, of the part-time soldier, being raised by the local landowner uh, with particular equipment. And then as time went on into the 18th century, you could be balloted. So you could be living in your village um, and you could be basically told that you will serve with the militia for a period of time. Um, you're there for home defence and you would be embodied uh, when required if there was a, a threat. And as the years went on, um, sometimes they were used and laws were changed to reinforce the regular army. So if you take the Battle of Waterloo in, in 1815, um, many of the British troops on, in that battle were actually militia who were sent out to reinforce the regular army because the regular army, of course, had been busy in the Peninsula War. Um, so the militia is the, is the oldest thread, if, if you like. The next sort of, depending on how you look at it, is the yeomanry. So the yeomanry, uh, who, of course, are on horses, were formed from 1794 onwards. So in Hampshire, you had the Hampshire Carabinier, uh, for example, were formed. Um, and they were formed because of the threat of France. So we're into that sort of Napoleonic threat again. But also, at that time, there was no police force. So police forces didn't really come into the country or get formed or whatever until about the 1830s. So if you wanted to put down any unrest in, in the town, so to speak, unlo uh, you know, un local unrest, then you could use a bit of the regular army, or you could call out some of the militia, or you could use the ye yeomanry. And of course, if you use the yeomanry on their horses, uh, that could be quite frightening to a crowd and be quite effective, even if they didn't use their swords properly. During that period, uh, at times around the country, the yeomanry were used to put down unrest uh, because of no police force. And sometimes things went uh, all right, and such as the Peterloo massacre. The yeomanry were in a, another effective home defence group. It was really expensive to have a horse, just as it is expensive to have a horse now. So uh, the people who were in the yeomanry tended to start off with anyway to be quite wealthy landowners who encouraged their workers, if you like, to uh, get on the horses and they provided the horses. Um, so it's quite a select group and, and they also develop very fancy uniforms. So yeah, you got you covered that in your book, and it was quite, yeah, they, they like to yeah. fancy themselves up the cavalry, still do. Absolutely. So so there's a yeomanry thread, yeah, so they, so they fancy themselves that. And then you come on to the volunteer. Well, volunteers have been asked for through centuries as well. Uh, and during the Napoleonic Wars, there was a period where they deliberately got extra volunteers in for a while. But the more recent, if you like, volunteers were formed in 1859, again from the threat of France at that time, despite the fact only a few years earlier we'd been on the same side in the Crimea. Um, and they, again, were raised for home defence in, in towns, and it was amazing how many groups of them were raised around the country and in counties. And they had another home defence role. So at this stage, you're talking about uh, 1859 onwards, you've got these three strands. You've got the militia still, you've got the yeomanry, and you've got the volunteer. Um, and so they're, they're running separate. Um, and the big sort of first conflict they, they get involved with, a proper conflict, you could argue, was the Boer War. So the beginning of, of the um, 20th century. Now, the Boer War uh, really exposed some problems across the whole army, both regular and reserves. And the whole army had a massive reorganisation afterwards. But what did happen is that elements of the yeomanry, the militia, and the volunteers did actually get involved in the conflict. And the reason they got involved was because they'd run out of regular soldiers. And there is a, a phrase that's occasionally used, which is that regulars start the war and the reserves finish it. Because you've only got a certain size pot 
um, in, in, in your buckets of regulars. And when they start running out, where are the rest going to come from? Um, and that was, we will come on to the First World War. But the, the Boer War, you had volunteers going out, Imperial Yeomanry is what they called them. Um, and they supplemented, if you like, the cavalry and became mounted infantry over in South Africa. You also had militia attached to the regular battalion and you also had the volunteers. And so um, they were being mixed up for the first time. And in fact, there was a, a nasty rail accident that occurred in South Africa, which happened to one of the Hampshire Regiment battalions. And of the dead, there were about 40 to 50 dead. Um, but there was a mixture in those dead from the militia and the volunteers and the regulars. So there's a start of a little bit of integration going on, as for the first time, those part-time soldiers were being used overseas on operations. So lots of things were identified, and I, and I suppose we then come on to uh, the Haldane reforms. Yeah, and, and these reforms are a series of far-ranging reforms of the army made from between 1906 to 1912, and they're named after the Secretary of State for War, Richard Burden Haldane. And they were the first major reforms since the children's reforms of the early 1880s. And as you said, were made in light of lessons learned in the Second Boer War. What was the significance to the reserve forces and later on how the Great War was fought? Well, the um, what Haldane did was create better integration, effectively, of the part-time soldier and, and the regular army. Um, so there's a big change. Um, there'd already been a couple of changes a few years before. So back in 1871, for example, the Lord Lieutenant representing uh, the Queen or the King in that county actually had control of the Yeomanry, the volunteers and, and the militia. So that was gradually taken off them and control was given to the army properly. So there's a bit of integration that, that was going on. But what how they did, you ended up with, let's take the Hampshire Regiment. Uh, they had first and second regular battalions. And then you have a third Special Reserve Battalion, which was formed from the old militia. So if you like, a, a, a form of immediate reinforcement. And then they had 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th and 8th battalions, which were territorial battalions, and a 9th battalion, which was a sightless battalion, which also a territorial battalion. So they're the same cat badge now. They've got a different number. Um, they are actually still separate groups. That's the big difference. They haven't all been integrated. So if you're a regular, you're in the 1st, 2nd Battalion. If you're a territorial, you're in the 4th to the ninth Battalions. So they were formed in their own groups and also formed in their own brigades uh, and sometimes in their own divisions. So they weren't all mixed up with, with, with the regulars. Um, but what it meant was that he was trying to create mass, if you like, a better mass of reinforcement. And so the regular army, which had had so many reorganizations, went off to the First World War as arguably one of the most efficient armies that went to war. But then you immediately had this group of territorial force, as he called it. So the militia, um, as I said, became the third specialist reserve battalions. The um, volunteers became the territorial battalions. The Yeomanry became part of the territorial force, but kept their names. And what happened is that initially the as, as the war started, people relied on the regular army. Um, and I'll give you another example of uh, a battalion that went to war. The 1st Battalion, the Queen's Royal West Surrey's, formed up in Borden uh, in 1914 with 1,000 men on parade. Uh, by the time you get to November of 1914, there's 40 men on parade. Just, and that was happening to other regular battalions as well. So they were more than decimated. So, But what happened initially with the territorial battalions is people said, well, they're not as well trained as all we'll do is send them overseas to garrisons and then we will release the regular units to come back to fight on the western front which is where the main fighting is going to happen and so a lot of the territorials a huge amount were sent overseas to garrisons to do that to relieve others to come back um so in india you got uh territorial hampshire battalions arriving in order for the second hampshires to come back um to england and then fight on the western front how did those soldiers feel about that at the time? Did they feel that they were missing out? There's a bit of a mixed feeling. Um, before the First World War, they, they actually had to sign up to volunteer to serve overseas. So in a sense, they joined on a more home defence basis. Uh, and in that sense, they volunteered to go overseas. And so they were sent overseas. 
So most people, I suppose, turned to the right and just got on with it, realizing the regulars got to come back to fight fight the war. But then, of course, well, you have all these casualties of the regulars. So who's going to backfill? And then you have the complications of the First World War, because actually, who were the first people who could backfill? The territorial force and troops from the empire, Indians and so on. And so uh, 1915 was a really important year for having other territorials plus empire troops on the Western Front, because otherwise we couldn't have hold, held the Western Front. Um, and as time goes on through the war, you end up with more territories going to the Western Front, but then also there are other campaigns in the rest of the world that the territories get involved with because they're over seeds in different places. And so one of the places the territories are involved with was Mesopotamia, now Iraq. Um, and I've written something called Kut 1916, which is a, about that. And in in that, you had the territorials mixing with the Indian army, mixing with the regular army, um, and fully integrated effectively in various battles and, and, and so on. Um, you also had places like Palestine. Well, the bulk of the troops in Palestine were actually territorials. And so you had a lot of territorials fighting overseas. You had some actually in, on the Western Front. And then, of course, you had Kitzner's new armies. You had regulars, you had territorials, and then Kitzner's new armies, who were obviously volunteered in 1914, as a, in a totally separate third group, were trained up, etc. And their first proper fighting really was in 1916. And so they, they then took the, the weight of the fight on the, on the Western Front. Right. Did these include the Powell's Battalion? Is that Kitchener's Army or the Powell's Battalion separate? To yeah, that? absolutely. No, no, Powell's Battalion is part of the Kitchener's Armies. And then Kitchener's Armies start running out, or they need more people. So in 1916, conscription comes in. So you've got this mixture of people um, who are in the Army for various reasons, regulars before the war, territorials before the war, just before the war, the new armies formed during the war, and then conscription. So quite a mix of people to create mass because we needed the bodies. And quite simply, if you go into a big war, you cannot just rely on the regular army. You've got to have more. So where's more going, going to come from, as, as, as we said earlier? Yeah, that's interesting. And just pick up on one of the things we discussed there. I asked that question, how did they feel about being posted overseas and the regulars going off to fight? Because I think maybe less so in Iraq and Afghanistan, but certainly in periods before that, the regulars would sometimes, and using my own period as a, an example, you'd get the TA lads coming in and they'd end up doing the rubbish jobs, staying back in yeah. camp, gate guarding or doing camp security, yeah. and the regulars would go off to fight. And that was something I was always very much aware of when I was a PSI with a TA because these lads don't join the TA to do that. They join to go and fight. And I think that sometimes it's a, a mix we've got wrong in the past, uh, and I don't yeah. know. No, 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 you're right. A lot of it is, um, there's a big cultural thing that existed, has existed for hundreds of years uh, and will continue into the future. Um, and it's only when people mix up together and they see each other's capabilities that things settle down. And it's, it's a bit like, on, as you know, because of what you did, um, you've got to have a period of training, for example, to get the territorial up to scratch, unless that territorial, of course, is a specialist anyway. That territorial could be a, highly qualified doctor who's just as good in uniform the next day as he would be in civvies in, in, in a hospital. Um, but there are many roles that need an extra bit of time training up, and some people don't always get that. So you always have friction between the full-timer and the part-timer. Um, these, as I say, these frictions only fade away when people work with each other, I think. When we're talking about the Haldane reforms, here, was that when they did away with purchasing of commissions, or was that before that? Uh, that was before. That was back in about 1870. We, we got a few listeners from overseas. Can you just briefly explain to the listener of what, what it meant by purchasing the commission? It says it's for a dozen of ten, but it's a very unusual and I think a uniquely British thing, I'd imagine. Well, I'd, to be honest, I, I don't think it would be particularly, it wouldn't be unique because um, over the years, different armies developed in, in, in different ways. Um, and what bottom line was, up until 1870, you had to purchase your commission. And you paid X thousand pounds to be a second lieutenant, lieutenant, captain, etc. Uh, and the likes of Wellington, the great commander and everything else, he worked his way up uh, through purchase. And that's how it was. So there wasn't necessarily a huge amount of meritocracy 
Although, if you fought very well in a particular campaign, yes, of course, you could be promoted, you could be commissioned and so on. So there were other groups of people coming through. Um, but yeah, that didn't go to 1870. And if you think that a, a senior officer who might have bought his commission in 1870, he potentially could still be serving 20 years later. You know, So it t- took a while to work its way through uh, until the more of a meritocracy comes through. Was that up to a certain rank? Like you could you could purchase up to lieutenant colonel, and then anything after that was performance based, or was it any rank you could purchase? Um, I think, to be honest, uh, money could come into it at any rank at that stage. <laughs> but a lot of that was dependent on what family you were in as well, wasn't it? Now you knew rather than what you knew. But uh, yeah, a few things have changed there. Yeah, because I remember reading one time. I think if there was three sons, didn't it? The first one inherited, the second one went into the army. And I think the third one went to the clergy or something. Or something. Yeah, that's right. The third one becomes a vicar or something. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> I think in times of war, the uh, the vicar would be glad he ended up where he did. <laughs> yeah, quite, quite. The period between the wars of it was a frustrating one for the newly formed TA, but integration of the regular reserve and conscript components of the army in World War Two was generally successful. And I think that contribution can be best summarised by the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry, who started the war as a mounted part-time cavalry unit in Palestine as we discussed that's where a lot of them ended up and it ended it as a seasoned and professional tank regiment with the most battle honours of any unit in the British Army so what are your thoughts on this period and the performance of the reserve during World War II well there's a there's a really frustration period uh, for both the regular army and the part time army between the two wars because someone had said um, politically they'd said we are are not going to have a war for 10 years well, as soon as you say you're not going to have a war for 10 years, who's going to spend any money on the army? And so people will stay in ranks for years and years and years. The kit wasn't good, training wasn't good, and, and all the rest of it. So it was frustrating for any type of soldier. But the, t- the territorial force, as it, as it was named in 1908, when Haldane did his reforms, was changed its name slightly to the Territorial Army. Um, and, it, and it struggled, just like the regulars did in between. But what they did do was have two key roles given to them. Uh, one was anti-aircraft defence and the other was coastal defence and uh, when it came to the Second World War of course uh, the anti-aircraft defence was really important so whilst um, the fly boys uh, in Spitfires and Hurricanes were you know, obviously critical for the Battle of Britain so was radar, uh, so was the anti-aircraft guns and, and guess what the, the TA manned the anti-aircraft guns and they were also manning searchlights, they're really important bits of kit in order to defend the country so that that did happen. But the big thing that happened at the beginning of the Second World War is that people got integrated straight away. Um, the, the, the country realised that unlike the First World War, where we had those, I talk, said mentioned those different types of soldiers, if you like, the best thing from the government's perspective was to integrate everybody. And so you ended up with conscription straight away, virtually, uh, which meant they knew they could get the mass So they weren't going to rely on volunteers this time. Um, But there were territorial units which actually were used as territorial units and they kept their names and their foundation was territorial. As the the war went on, they would be more mixed up with regulars and territorials and conscripts. Um, But they did keep their identity um, and were very successful. And um, again, if you go back to the the, the Hampshire Regiment, out of the three Victoria Crosses won in, in the Second World War, Two of them were actually territorial Victoria Crosses. So they, they performed well. Um, there were challenges at the beginning of the war. There was a disastrous campaign uh, in Norway. Some territorial units were sent there who were poorly equipped and not brilliantly trained and so on. But both the regulars and the territorials didn't do brilliantly there. Um, withdrawal back to Dunkirk. People were doing their best. Um, but, you know, they could only do what they could with the resources they had. Um but as the Second World War develops, as I said, they kept their identity um, and you have formed territorial units fighting in all theatres of war. So actually, that worked and they had the mass as well. But there was less of this sort of separate grouping, if, if, if you like. They were further mixed together. Um, there were other famous people who did things. You had a, a Victoria Cross, one of the Battle of Kahima by a, a territorial in the Royal West Kent Regiment, Queen's Royal West Kent Regiment. Um, there are lots of examples of individual um, sacrifice and service and so on. Because they were all mixed up, the number of the unit 
may have been territorial, but they were all mixed up a bit, and um, everyone did their best. Best, and there was there was less us and them, if you like. Yeah. Again, as soon as people started working together, there wasn't generally a problem. Yeah, you know, the barriers come down. Yeah. In your book, you start seeing women coming into the territorial forces post World yep. War One, and then certainly in World War Two, if I remember yep. rightly, a lot of those searchlight and anti aircraft units were uh, manned by women soldiers were well, quite a few of them uh, territorials then yeah ab- absolutely back in 1897 would you believe there was the army nursing service reserve um then you come into just after the Boer war you've got the um queen you've got the queen alexandra's imperial military nursing service but you've also then coming in uh, just before uh haldane's reforms a territorial force nursing service um you had the first aid nursing yeonry um, coming into play. So by 1914, there's also Women's Volunteer Reserve and the Women's League. Um, things develop. And then, of course, you've got the Auxiliary Territorial Service, which the late Her Majesty the Queen was within. So women had much greater part as time went on, starting off with driving, nursing, signals, and then that gradually expands uh, as, as time goes on. Um, but then, of course, only in recent years that women have landed in the infantry. But it's all it's you know, open to everything now, of course. But it, it took time. But women were critical. And absolutely, in the Second World War, all the anti-aircraft elements, search charts and things were, were manned by women. Absolutely. Uh, you're right. I mean, it's taken a long time for women to be fully integrated yeah. in the armed forces. But I think when you look back at it, in some respects, Britain must have led the way. Because Nazi Germany, for example, wouldn't allow women anywhere near the forces, even they had yeah. suffering from some real manpower shortages. Reserve forces continued to evolve and adapt during the Cold War and beyond. And 18,000 territorial and regular reserves deployed in Operations Telic and Herrick, and 15 were killed. What was the most significant thing about this post-war time for the reserves? The first thing is that a lot of people don't realise that when conscription finished... Uh, national service continued after the Second World War. So what you had in the territorial unit, you probably had uh, quite a lot of people in territorial units who had fought in the war, so they might have spent four or five years in uniform. So they were just as trained as any regular would, would be, but they'd gone back to their civilian professions. But you also had new soldiers coming in, and if you did your national service, and remember that ran to about early 1960, 61, you had to do territorial service after your national service people don't realize that so actually what you had in your unit is pretty well trained people coming in to you know to start off with because they've done their national service so that the ta immediately after the war was a little bit different as far as that's concerned less pure volunteers with less training they were, they were more more training um and and there was a very large organization however when you come to the mid-60s there is a massive massive cut and the thought process mainly, or the justification for that massive cut, was connected with the atomic bomb. And so people were thinking, well, hang on, you know, why do we need lots of people for home defence, territorial army, and, and everything else, if actually all that's going to happen is we're going to kill each other as uh, so a mutually assured destruction or something. And so there were major cuts in, in, in the 60s. And you, you end up, and the book goes through this, with sort of different, w- at one stage it goes up a bit, then it goes down a bit, then it comes up a bit. Um so the national service thing is a is a key thing. The big cut, the massive cut in the sixties, because capability obviously was taken away. But then, as we move uh, further forward into the into seventies, eighties, nineties, you end up with rules being changed to make it easier to mobilise the TA. Um, and of course, you've already mentioned the figures for Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the Balkans as as well. Um, so you actually start regular start seeing the TA as it is then doing more stuff. And as the TA becomes the Army Reserve, again, further integration where, wherever possible. Um, and then you get into the debate of, um, so can the TA provide individual reinforcements or can it provide unit or subunit reinforcements? Um, and to be honest, that argument was going on with different names hundreds of years ago. And that argument continues now, which is a fundamentally, what is the Army Reserve for? What role should it have? Uh, how integrated should it be? Now, all this stuff is exactly the same now. Yeah. That people have been asking for many, many years. So some fundamental things haven't changed very much. As And the other thing I already mentioned, what do you spend your money on? You know, regulars, reserves, whatever. 
um, it's, it's tricky getting the balance right. I always felt sorry for people that came on as individual reserves because you know yourself from your time. You're, you're entering a very tight-knit group of people. Yeah. And you've got nothing to hang your hat on. You're trying to fit yeah. in. You're trying to overcome some prejudice. And yeah. then, then you hopefully become integrated into that unit. You do your tour in Iraq or Afghanistan, for example, and then you come home and you cut loose and you've lost that support yeah. network. Yeah. And I think yeah. there's, a, there's quite a few records out there of uh, reserve soldiers having a really hard time post-service because of that individual mm. uh, augmentation. It's just, and I don't know how you're going to square that circle if you keep doing that. I think it will always be, be difficult, but we're back to the culture and people understanding that if, if they if they go to war or, or whatever now, at least 30% of the army is part-time. And therefore, as soon as you start going to war any form of scale, you need mass. And therefore, you've got to have these volunteers. So rather than thinking in a narrow, regular mind, you have to think, right, I'm going to have part-timers. They may not be as well-trained to start off with. Where am I going to put them? How am I going to use them? Um, and I suppose the better commander knows how to use them best. And as he sees their performance, he can use them in the same way potentially as any other of the type. There's been talks of we should look at other countries, likes of uh, the sort of the Nordic model. And then yep. you have also what you see happening in U Ukraine. And then Ukraine, I forget the name of the operation over here, that the British were training Ukraines, but they were basically coming over here and doing about six weeks and then being thrown into the front lines. Looking at that Nordic model, looking at what's happening in Ukraine, is there anything we can learn from that, do you think? I think we can we can always learn from everybody. I think what um, Ukraine reinforces again is what I said earlier, the fact that once you've used up your, your regular box of soldiers, you've got to have some more reinforcement. You've got to have some more mass. So what's the most effective way of getting that mass? At the end of the day, it all comes down to what insurance policy you want, how much mm -hmm. money you're going to spend on it. There's much more talk now of using, for example, the strategic reserve, which for many years has been left to be quiet and you know not they haven't been used. So that group of people who were regulars, who have only been out a year or two or whatever, could be called up. They may not want to be, mm. but they signed a piece of paper that says they could be called up in a crisis. So there's a lot more thought going to that again. There's another group of people who could be used. Another group, specialist group, is the sponsored reserve. Most people know the sponsored reserve, for example, people who in um, Sioux Street might be driving tank transporters. Uh, and then if there's a requirement to mobilize, if you like, they put a uniform on, they do the same job. So there's another little group that could, in theory, be expanded. So sponsored reserves, strategic reserves, the traditional volunteer reserve, which we've been talking about mainly, you need to go into different buckets, perhaps, to, to get the right people to do the task. And and that's not, not easy. Future soldier for the reserves described in 2021 as... This will deliver an army reserve which gives its people a sense of purpose and belonging. It will be embraced by society employees for, I quote, being there in times of need and fully integrated with its regular counterparts as part of a whole force ready to fight when called upon. The target was 30,100 trained reserve personnel and the current train strength as at 1st of January 24 was well short at 24,130. Throughout the centuries, what struck me in your book was not only was the reserve capability in all its forms broad, it was very deep as well. And I don't think we have that breadth or depth at all anymore. I even look back to my time in the 80s, you, know, you, you had what we've discussed before with the territorials uh, and, and other strands on that, including the Home Defence Force, which was stood up for a brief few years. I think you mentioned that in your book as well. I do, yeah. Yeah, and we seem to have lost that, and I just don't know how... Have we gone past the point of no return? Uh, I don't think so. I think um, if there's if there's the will, there's there's the way, um, and people have to make it clear what what they want. And if people say what they want, you know, it's then up to the forces to decide how they provide that capability. And there's that balance between technology. We all know that technology is marvelous, and, and you can use technology to 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 for lots of things. But at the end of the day, there's still a mass element. There's still boots on the ground. You need a certain amount of people. And we're back to the business of, if, you know, if you've got £100 to spend on this, how much are you going to spend on this and, and, and that? 
But I think I've already said, you know, you can dip into these different pots, for example, which haven't necessarily been used in recent years. The strategic reserve hasn't really been used in recent years. The sponsored reserve could be expanded. Uh, volunteer reserve service, you know, more efforts on getting more of, of them in. So I think there there is a way. It's just people have got to be clear what, what the requirement is. And it's interesting as well, because when you look back to Afghanistan and Iraq, I talked to civilian friends who just don't get what was attractive. The army had no problem recruiting during Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. yeah. And I think people, there's nothing worse than being a garrison soldier. You'll know that and I know that. You know, people back in the 80s were itching to get to Northern Ireland because you don't want to sit, yeah. you don't want to sit in a subs bench. Yeah. And again, it's that offer now, I think, Back in my day, there was 16% unemployment where I came from. The army changed my life for the better. The army's really up against it now with both regulars and reserves because the offer is, is being derided in the press all the time, quite rightly as well, with the accommodation. I struggled to see how we're gonna, you were going to make that offer better. I don't know what your thoughts on that are. It's always going to be challenging. And I think using those different groups, I mean, the other thing that the services are trying to bring in is, is what they call a zigzag career. So you can do a bit, bit of regular, then go part-time, then come regular, and, and, and so on. Now, that might be a more attractive thing to do for many people, which might bring in more people if they see that they can do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and it's not quite the same commit that, that they had. So there's another angle as well. I, I, I doubt there's a silver bullet. Yeah. I think there's a, a combination of, of different things uh, that would need to be brought in. But it's a challenge. But I think it can be solved. But um, perhaps, again, you've got to think in slightly different ways than some of the ways things have been done in the past. And I've always said to people, you never join the army to get rich, but you do need properly remunerated yeah. and looked after when you're in it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So. Where can people get a copy of your book, Patrick? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, Rose Castle and, and Crown, um, the Hampshire of the Yellow White Citizen Soldiers, is online anywhere. You can, if you tap it, my name, Crowley, and... Um, the book, Rose Castle and Crown, uh, you'll find it on the internet in various places. Very easy to be seen. Um, so I, I hope people enjoy it. And as usual, we'll finish off with Desert Island Dits, which is a guest choice of book, film and luxury item. So what have you picked for us tonight? Well, my book choice is a bit cheating. It's it's, it's basically Richard Holmes's book. I mean, Richard Holmes was a, a great military historian. He's no longer with us. He was also the colonel of my regiment, despite the fact he was a territorial. So very unusual for the territorial to be colonel of the regiment. Any of his books, which are military history books, uh, would, would go down well with me. And he wrote a great book about the PWR in Iraq. He did, Dusty Warriors. Dusty yeah. Warriors, that was the one. And he did yeah. he not teach at Sandust as well? Yes, he did, yeah. yeah. Does, yeah. Did you ever meet him? I did, yeah. I think when I, as I passed through, he was he was teaching there. And then at one time, funny, funnily enough, uh, when I was a second lieutenant, I was attached to his company for some training. And he was a company commander with five fifth battalion of the queen's regiment oh, so um, i joined him on exercise as well yeah and he also did a great series i think it was on the bbc years ago called uh, was it richard holmes war walks i think he did that's right the war, war walks um and um they're still they're still being shown uh in fact i think recently they showed a few of those and he was always quite clever what he wore he always wore the same sort of type of shirt so he, he had continuity and instantly <laughs> recognizable the amount of times you hear him being name-checked with people, I think sometimes he's not as well-known as he should be, but he's very well yeah. revered in sort of the history world, isn't he? Absolutely. You know, the, he was a decent, very decent gentleman, as well as being extremely competent uh, author and extremely charismatic and good speaker. So, uh, yeah, you good, good man. And your film choice? Oh, it has to be Zulu. <laughs> <laughs> was there any of your forebears... Uh, involved in that? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, it's a good film. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And the uh, luxury item? Uh, well, luxury item, I think, would be would be travel. Fucking <laughs> that. So <laughs> to get off the island. <laughs> yeah, travel around the world. Um, <laughs> so I think, yeah, that'll do. As no, nobody's picked that before. My choice this episode, as I said earlier, is Patrick's book. I'm not just saying that because he's he's been kind enough to come on the podcast. I learned an awful lot from it. And as we discussed earlier, I am a bit biased because I served for two years as a permanent staff instructor at the TA. But I really do think it opens your eyes up to, to how well provided we were as a nation going over the centuries. And that rapid decline from post-war, post-Second World War to today is astonishing in my eyes. So I, I can highly recommend your book. Thank you very much, Colin.
that's it for another episode and thanks to Patrick for coming to the podcast and to the listener for your continued support and suggestions. Please keep them coming and our email and social media links are at the bottom of the show notes. You can find us on all the usual suspects including Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. And if you've downloaded us from iTunes and like the podcast, it'd be great if you could leave us a review there or anywhere you get your podcast from. Thanks again to Nick Beale for his continued help and offering technical support for his company ISAR. And we'll see you next time on The Unconventional Soldier.